Hey folks, welcome to Dr. Crispy's Schmookon Schwag Time Band. So somebody likes you. First, some t-shirts for smaller people. The t-shirt sizes are the t-shirt sizes. I can't wear this stuff. That's a moose oven mitt. <laughs> this, I'm not chucking, this is gonna hurt somebody. This, this, this is the control alt hack game. It's uh, white hat security hacking in the form of a card game. What member of the Schmoo group helped develop this? You. No. <laughs> what? <laughs> Android apps. Hey guys, um, all right. Um, my name is Roman, and today I'm going to talk about war stories. What kind of war stories? Um, well, so there's. You know, we're going to talk about some of the interesting things that have been happening in the world of Android application security over the past couple of years. Some of the um, some of the interesting uh, vulnerabilities that were found, and we're going to talk about what those vulnerabilities were, how to avoid them. You know, how to how to how to fix how to fix those issues, right? Most of those things are going to be pretty simple, but you know, they're notorious. They're they're simple to fix, but Unfortunately, they're still there. So, so we're going to talk about this, and also, at the end of the talk, uh, I'm going to demo an app that I've written, which is kind of like a Hack Me style application. Uh, it's, an, it's an Android application um, that, you know, hopefully, hopefully you guys will have uh, fun taking apart. So, um, you know, I feel this, this talk may be, may be useful you know, to people who are you know, developing some, some apps uh, for Android, one, if you're a pen tester, you know, who's looking to get into the field of um, Android, Android security testing and you want to learn some more about Android security, this may be, this may be a, um, a, um, an interesting talk for you too. So, um, all right, just a quick, a quick caveat here uh, in terms of what this talk is not about. Because I, I kind of have to kind of say this. Uh, no dramatic, we're not going to discuss any like dramatic zero days today. We're not going to talk about you know, kernel exploitation um, uh, or, or platform security. It's probably not going to be the talk. But like I said, hopefully you guys will have fun uh, uh, listening to this. So, uh, so with this, uh, we are starting. So, war stories. So these are, uh, these are some of the categories of different issues that we've been seeing um, and, you know, not only us uh, when we do our uh, penetration tests, but also um, you know things that uh, Mobile OWASP Top 10 uh, has been talking about for quite a while. So these are some of the very common issues. And so, um, and so, and, and so we thought, well, why, why don't we like why don't we write an app, right? Why don't we write an app to try to cover some of those very common issues? And so the app that I'm going to demo at the end of the talk is going to be pretty accurately mapped to all of those, um, all of those categories and there's going, to be, uh, there's going to be a topic for, for each, um, each one of those, um, each one of those um, um, categories. This is a quick preview of what the app is going to look like and we're going to start with logging. So I wanted to kind of start with this because this is one of the very easy things to, um, I, I don't want to say exploit necessarily, but I would say take advantage of rather because uh, to get to a log that an Android application is throwing to the log hat um, is, is actually relatively easy, right? I mean, you know, to do that, the only thing you have to do if you're a, you know, if you're, let's say, a hacker and you have the phone, is you just, uh, you know, you just hook it up um, with, with a USB cable, 
or uh, you know, some, some apps, uh, and we're gonna get to this in a minute, uh, could also read logs um, a little while ago. And so uh, the point of this is that there is um, a pretty high um, probability of some sensitive information that's being put out to the log. So if you think that you know, stuff like usernames, uh, you know, passwords, IDs, authorization, uh, authentication tokens, uh, stuff like that doesn't get logged, well it does. And so here's a couple examples. You know, passwords uh, that are being re revealed in the Android log or um, Facebook uh, authentication tokens, auth tokens, or uh, you know, last four digits of a credit card number being, <coughs> being outputs, you know, even more passwords. So, so, so the thing is, like I said, this is one of the very, uh, very old issues and um, one, uh, the, the earlier samples of malware, um, they had the, they had, they would basically request a read log permission and, uh, and requesting the read log permission would give them the capability to read other apps, um, other apps logs. So, all right, <laughs> should, should I start with this? Um, no, I'll probably keep this until the end. All right. All right. So, all right, I can start making cocktails here. Um, anyway, so um, before Android 4.1, um, accessing, accessing um, your application logs was actually pretty easy um, because all that a malicious app had to do was to request read logs permission. If you as a user granted that permission, now that app could go out and grab those logs. Now, from Android 4.1 and, and up, it made it a little, bit uh, a little bit more difficult because now, even though you can um, request the read logs permission, you're really not going to get it. So, so the system is not going to, uh, to grant that permission. So that gives you some degree of protection. But at, at, at the same time, you know, um, Android 4.1 Plus is, is at a limited, at a limited uh, you know, distribution in the, in, the, um, you know, in, in the marketplace right now. So it's still important to, uh, you know, look for, look for the uh, places in, in your code if you're a developer or in the code uh, that you're reviewing as a pen tester for log entries because there is a lot of juicy stuff in there. So, like, as a developer, um, it's probably going to be hard to like find find those things because they tend to, tend to hide, especially you know if you have if you have a pretty big application. Um, but at the at the same time, you know, a lot a lot a lot a lot a lot of interesting stuff <laughs> is in there. So um, so yeah, this is uh, this, so this is basically it. Uh, make sure make sure that nothing nothing sensitive gets dumped to a uh, to a log. Oh, and one more point. I guess you know, if a malicious application is running as root, then you know all of those protections um, you know, don't really don't really work anymore. So it's going to be able to read your logs no matter what. All right. So moving on to file permissions. So what, so when I talk about file permissions, um, what I what I what I mean most of the time is I want to talk about world writable and world readable files. Um, so, even though this may not happen as often as some other vulnerabilities that, that, that we're seeing, when it does happen, the consequences tend to be pretty destructive uh, and, 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 and pretty bad. And so I wanted to bring, uh, um, to bring in an example of, uh, of Lookout Security, which is, which is uh, um, you know, a security product, Android security product, a, a vulnerability in which was discovered by um, by uh, Team Jock, so that John Oberheide and Zach Lanier, as well as uh, Tevis Romandi, kind of who independently independently discovered the vulnerability as well. And so, what the vulnerability was was that the application decided that it can place its system database um, and a configuration file inside its app directory, except make except make it world readable and writable. So any app could go out and update update those two files. What ended up happening, and this is an exploit that uh, Tevis Romandi ended up writing, um, he ended up updating those files to have them picked up by the Lookout security application, and uh, that resulted in the uh, like administrative actions being carried out on behalf of a malicious app by the Lookout security product. Um, so, you know, 
Android tries pretty hard, um, well not Android, like the whole development environment tries pretty hard at, to prevent you from setting like relaxed permissions on um, application files, right? Uh, like Eclipse, for example, uh, throws you know, a ton of warnings saying, that, hey, are you really sure, are you absolutely sure that you want to set a world writable um, uh, permission on the file? So, you know, most of the time I would recommend, you know, again, if you're a pen tester to your clients, uh, you know, don't, don't use world writable stuff. There's really no reason, no reason to do that. And also, a special case is um, SD card permissions. So SD card being, uh, you know, being most of the time formatted as a VFAT a file system, there's really the lack of concept of file ownership. And because there's no file ownership, anyone can access everything. So don't put secrets onto, a, onto an SD card. That, uh, that may not be such a good idea because the whole world is going to be able to um, read it. Oh, and just as a... Uh, as a uh, little, uh, I guess, a caveat here is uh, like all of the vulnerabilities that I'm talking about um, have already been patched. So, like I said, no zero days today. Um, all right, moving on to content provider. So, why would you need a content provider? You need it to share, right? But when you share, most of the time you want to share only with select people, select apps, select entities, right? Um, and um, and Basically, what a content provider is on Android, it's, it's like a structured storage mechanism that, for all intents and purposes, acts as a database, right? And so, um, so you can use that just to share data with the outside world, with the app. So one example is, uh, let's say you have an email program that reads, um, you know, you can read emails in, 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 in the program, and you can also open up attachments. Like, let's say there's an image, and if you want to view an image with a, um, if, if you want to view an image with a gallery viewer, then you know gallery viewer may may choose to access the email client's content provider to get the data. So, one one of the problems that uh, that are there with content providers, or could be there, is when it starts to leak, um, which means that other apps can all of a sudden start um, accessing those providers. And here, another war story is uh, the Dropbox. And in uh, 2011, Tyrone Erasmus um, found a vulnerability where you could access the content provider that was advertised, that was shared out by the, um, by the uh, Dropbox application. And you could read the entire database. And as, res and as a result of that, like being a malicious application, you could just upload users' data for public access to, to, to anyone. And so if you look at the little snippet of code, you'll see that the uh, provider tag, um, uh, first of all, it doesn't, list, it doesn't list any permissions whatsoever. And also, the uh, uh, grant your right permission um, tag has a path prefix attribute set to slash. So that effectively makes the whole database available uh, for, for others to, uh, to look at. So, so that's a bit of a problem. So make sure that that when you that when you share when you share a content provider, um, you only share it with granular permission. So so you specify who exactly you're sharing it with. Um, it may be a good idea to use signature level permissions. So with signature level permissions, what happens is only the applications that have been signed by the same key as your application can now access um, can now access your resource or a content provider in this case. <coughs> So um, uh, one, other, one other point that I have here on the slide that I wanted to talk about separately is the parameterized methods for queries. Since uh, you know, content provider um, implements several, several database, database methods, um, it, it's normally a good idea to just use the methods that are provided by the Google platform and not try to write your own code in order to not open yourself up for, um, for, for SQL injection. Because SQL injection can happen anywhere. It doesn't have to be a web app. It can also happen locally inside your, inside your application if your input is not, uh, is not properly validated. So um, this, little, uh, this little diagram uh, is actually taken from the, from, from the Android developer's website, from the Google reference that shows how, uh, how, the, how the query arguments, and, and, and the query arguments is used to basically pull stuff from the content provider, how it maps to, um, to the SQL statements. 
or, 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 or just SQL, SQL um, operators and, 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 and keywords. And so most of, this, most of the time, what you need to do with SQL, you, can also only, uh, you could also do with, um, with uh, content provider methods such as the query method. So use that. All right, so URIs. Um, the URI um, is effectively a, a, a scheme that lets you, you know, in, invoke an application to handle a, a certain type of resource, right? So if you have an HTTP colon slash slash, that's a URI scheme that may trigger a browser. If you have a my app colon slash slash blah blah blah, that may trigger the my app um, application. So you would normally declare the uh, the URI scheme in the um, in the manifest under the data tag. And um, the example that I wanted to talk about here, a pretty destructive one, <laughs> or destructive in a, in a funny way, I guess, um, is is an example that um, that that. that Colin Molliner uh, presented, I believe it was NinjaCon in 2011, and so uh, this was a this was a case where um, it was an NFC um, an NFC token an NFC tag that, uh, that 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 was presented to a phone, and then the Android system would parse out the um, URI out of the data encoded in the tag. And then the, uh, the, the URI that was extracted was passed over to the Foursquare app because it was registered as the handler for that URI. And well, guess what happened? So the URI, uh, I'm sorry, the Foursquare application just goes ahead and makes an authenticated call to the server, completely trusting the data that came from the tag. So why is this a problem? Well, so, so, so so what happened was, let's say that you wanted to, um, to check in at, at Times Square. Um, so, and, and by the way, like all, of the, all the screenshots here, um, all the screenshots here came from Colin, Colin's presentation, so I'm, I'm crediting him for this. Um, so let's say that you want to check in at, at Times Square. What happens in the Foursquare application in the back end is, uh, it gets associated with, with a certain with a certain name of the, the venue name, right? But what does not happen is that the name is not associated with the venue ID. So, for example, if an attacker were to create a uh, a little a little uh, um, you know fake fake uh, you know, NFC transponder that would that when when you or, or fake NFC tag, I'm sorry, that would have a venue name that was Times Square, which is where you think you are. But the venue ID that was different, you end up uh, checking in uh, someplace else in Chippendales. So, um, well, I guess I guess ev everyone sees like potential issues with that, especially if you do this during work hours. That thing. <laughs> so, so, some other potential scenarios, um, potential scenarios that could happen here is um, effectively. What's was cross site request forgery, right? What if if uh, the application just blindly passes data that that's been received from the tag, it gets it uh, over to the server. Well, if you have some more sensitive functionality, such as you know add a follower or add a friend, uh, things like that, you end up making all of those requests in the context of an authenticated session. And as a result, you may end up like adding, adding, adding uh, you know, a follower that, that you didn't really want to follow. So like, all sorts of stalking issues come up here. So <laughs> uh, the moral of the story is, uh, you know, I, this is like this is a really a really old thing, and I'm sure you guys have heard this multiple times already. But this is another example why you shouldn't trust anything that comes from an, from 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 uh, from outside your application, even if it's like an NFC interface uh, that you know you, you 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 may think it may be more secure for whatever reason. Truth of the matter is, it may not be. Oh. So another interesting, another interesting vulnerability here is uh, what happens when we take a URI handler and we somehow combine this with a web view. So this may not make sense right now, but hopefully it will in a few minutes. So what's a web view? Um, essentially, it's like a simple, um, a simple class, um, a simple mechanism to view web-based content in your application. 
Um, even though it's pretty simple, it actually supports some pretty interesting functionality. It supports a bit more than just static pages. For example, JavaScript. Other, plug like other client-side stuff as well, but JavaScript is an example that I want to talk about today. So a JavaScript interface, um, you, can, you, can, you can add the capability for your web view to interact with your application. So even though by default JavaScript is disabled, you can deliberately enable it. And well, there could be potentially issues with that as well. And you really have to ask yourself a question. Do you need that? Do you need JavaScript? What happens if the JavaScript that I'm putting in my web view has an interface in my application that it can access? And that interface supports some sensitive functionality. Well, what can happen is, let's say I register a URI handler. Uh, it's called Blob. So everything, everything uh, that starts with Blah is going to be handled by my app. So then I take whatever data came from the URI, I stick that into a JavaScript-enabled web view. So now there's stuff, JavaScript uh, client-side stuff running in the web view, but then there's an interface, a JavaScript interface that's exposed that my application can now talk back, to, uh, that the JavaScript can talk back to the application through. So if I post a link on any page, right, that contains this URI handler, and I specify a malicious payload, it will effectively end up invoking some uh, potentially destructive functionality on the application because it can talk to it through the JavaScript interface. So uh, here's, here's, here's a real life example here. Um, this is a manifest where uh, you have a, d a data scheme, blah, right? And then uh, this is where stuff that was that, that got into the uh, got into the application from the uh, from the URI gets stuck into the web view. So this is a link that I can put on my website so that it would be <clears throat> all right. It is it is better. All right. Who who have I been talking to all this time? <laughs> All right. Um, anyway, so uh, so yeah, when you take when you, when you take stuff that, uh, that that came from the from the from the um, from the URI and it got into the web view. Now, if I advertise an, a, a JavaScript interface inside my application, and it eventually makes it into the web view, well, I can invoke code through the JavaScript interface uh, uh, through the JavaScript interface functionality and execute code within the application. This is the code that's that's being run within the app. So stuff goes from the web into the application. Application takes the uh, ex parses the URI, puts it to the web view. Web view runs and then calls stuff back um, on the application on the JavaScript interface. So possible problems here. You, you know you can you can um, end up just giving up control of your application to a malicious entity, to a bad guy who ends up posting a link on the web page, um, or you know, alter your data. Um, so there's, there's a whole bunch of different bad things that can come out of this. So if you can, uh, a couple of things that um, I would recommend here. First, uh, make sure that you limit the uh, domains that you can load through the web view. There's really no reason for your web view to load stuff other than from places that you that you would expect to load stuff from. Um, so if you have uh, some, some server backend that serves you know, HTTP content, you can specify that as one of the restrictions. And also, be very careful with the JavaScript interfaces because uh, you don't want to enter this functionality that may be invoked uh, by, uh, by code that comes in through the web view in, in, a, malicious, in a malicious fashion. All right, now let's talk about intent. So um, I'm hoping most of you know that in, with intent, uh, you're, you're essentially like passing kind of like event-based messages between different applications. And um, 
even though stuff happens locally, you know, the same input validation paradigm, believe it or not, applies here as well. So here you should also make sure that you, you know, don't trust uh, stuff in the intent blindly and require permissions every time you're um, handling, uh, handling intents. The example here is uh, Google Watch, and this is something that, uh, that, that our um, interpreters guys um, found uh, in, in, uh, in, in April of 2012, where um, a malicious application could enable uh, remote logging uh, I take it back, not remote logging. It, it could enable um, logging of, um, of uh, last four digits of a credit card through throwing a, um, a, um, an intent. And the application, the Google Wallet, did not verify uh, the sender of that intent. And so this little uh, snippet of code here shows, um, well, this is basically in a, a piece of the exploit code. So what happens here is um, an intent gets declared by, let's say, our application written by Intrepidus. Uh, we set the action to uh, blah, 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 change log priority level, and that's, and that's the action that um, Google Wallet will have an intent filter for. Then we add a little um, extra field uh, to turn on uh, you know, verbose logging, and then we just kind of bless, bless it out. And what happens is, well, of course, the application starts dumping the, uh, dumping the uh, uh, parts of the uh, credit card number. So this is what the, uh, so, so this is what the receiver like, looked back then, right? So anyone can just send stuff to it because it will be intercepted by the intent filter. It will be caught by the intent filter, and the receiver, uh, the broadcast receiver would act on that. Um, this could have probably fixed it. Because once you don't export your intent, now you, now, now you can be sure that only the components of your application can, uh, can access, <coughs> uh, can, 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 can send stuff to the, uh, send stuff to the, uh, to the receiver. Um, another way um, to, um, you know, to, to expose this intent, but only limited to certain entities that should be calling stuff in it would be uh, to, to, require, to require permissions. So when you request a permission, and especially if that's, if that's again, a signature-based uh, signature permission, right, you're ensuring that whoever, whoever, sends a, um, wh wh whoever sends an intent to your receiver uh, or, your, or, to your, or to your application has the, um, uh, has the same signature as your app. I mean, you don't have to use signature permissions, but I'm just saying that because uh, signature permissions are normally transparent to the users, uh, to the users, they don't have to actually go and click and say, "Hey, it's fine. I accept your app. I accept that your app needs this permission." So, because of this, uh, because of the fact that it's transparent, it may be, it may make for a better user experience when when you when you do it this way. So. Um, Couple of things to watch out for. So, if there is an intent filter, uh, the the activity instantly becomes exported. So, you have to make sure that if you don't mean to export your your activity or only have it accessible by your internal components, you set the exported attribute to false. And, like I said, for sensitive actions, definitely make sure that whoever calls into your app um, um, has the proper proper permission level. And also, you know, when you invoke activities, big granular, and when I say big granular, basically require, uh, re require that the, the, the um, activity is invoked by the class name, if possible. Now, I understand this may not be possible in all times, because sometimes you just don't know what the class name is going to be if you're calling into a different application. That said, think about a scenario where the, your intents that you're throwing matches several intents, intent filters. And so if it matches several intent filters, this could potentially bring about a security issue because what happens if someone who's trying to intercept my intent ends up being malicious? And I, as a user, say, oh, all right, I'm, I'm going to open this uh, link with either Google Maps or G00 Google Maps, and uh, I end up clicking on the wrong thing, and the intent ends up going to the wrong place. And this kind of goes back to the, uh, to the prior recommendation that I mentioned about not putting sensitive stuff in intents in the first place. 
All right. Um, encryption issues over the network. We're going to talk about a couple things here. Um, first of all, I think it's pretty safe to assume right now that you know, since you're most of you are probably pen, you know, pen testers, um, I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, you know, intercepting stuff locally is pretty easy, right? So man in the middling stuff um, is man in the middling stuff. If you're if you're local, is 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 is, is relatively easy. Not so much when you're when you sit on a different machine, but if you're if you're local, that's easy. And you know, when developers do something like they they use self-signed certificates in their production code, well, guess what happens? All right, so you're essentially getting getting rid of the whole CA validation model and certificate authorities because any any certificate is now a good certificate. I can put whatever I want as a man in the middle, and uh, and see the traffic. Uh, when would that happen? When it, well, if you override the uh, the trust store, the, the default. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the default trust manager in Java. That's what's that's what's going to happen. By the way, it's difficult. Overriding that manager is difficult, but we've seen it done. Uh, the thing is, um, like I said, like like with some other um, other items, Eclipse makes it uh, makes it difficult. Java complains uh, a lot about this, so. Don't override default trust manager. Um, so how does how does uh, SSL validation work on Android? So most of the time, um, the SSL validation would be done by the Android system. So it would look in the in the trusted certificate authority trusted uh, certificate authority store, right? And it would say, hey, the certificate that I'm that, that I'm seeing from a server is that good? Can I trust it? Can I not trust it? And then it makes a decision based on that. So if, as an attacker, you end up pushing this, your certificate into the trust store, you can now see the traffic. Well, before Android 4.0, you could use, uh, like, you, you could use the uh, KSERS PKS um, uh, trust store, but you had to be rooted to push stuff, to push your uh, certificate, uh, your signing certificate into that store. With Android 4.0, things have become a lot easier. Uh, you can now use user certs, which means that all you have to do is just put your signing cert on an SD card and just import it. And, and, and that's it. Now, you're, now your, your system trusts any certificate that it sees. So what do you do about this? Um, as a developer, uh, it may be a good idea to use certificate pinning. With certificate pinning, um, what, what you would essentially do, you would, you, would, you would pin the public key of your server to the domain name, to your domain name. So every time, every time that um, um, every time that your application tries to reach out to a server, it would know it would know uh, the exact the exact um, uh, the exact certificate that it should be seeing. Um, another another way to do certificate pinning is instead of pushing the um, the exact certificate um, hash, uh, the, the, the hash of the public key into the uh, code, you can also, also have the signing certificate of the certificate authority that only you can sign your certs with. And that way, um, you can check if the server uh, cert that you're connecting to, if, if a cert has been signed by the known CA, now, now you know that in your code you're pinning it to a certain CA, and now that you know that it can be trusted. So in a way, you're uh, kind of removing the um, normal CA validation out of the, uh, you're removing it from the picture completely. Um, so is pinning um, a good idea? Definitely. Is that a silver bullet? Probably not. There are ways to, th there are ways to bypass those. Um, like ISEC partners uh, enjoy the SSL bypass tool has been written specifically to bypass pinning on, um, on, uh, on, on uh, Android applications, but the thing is, it's not an app. It's not an app that's like you know very very easy to kind of uh, break break out and use. It definitely makes the hacker's job of breaking the application a lot harder. Um, so I would I would say that it's still it's still a good idea to to uh, to you know, add another degree of complexity to um, 
to the uh, to the hackers to the hackers job. And by the way, if you guys are interested in uh, you know reading more about um, certificate pinning, um, I would suggest uh, reading the uh, Moxie Marlin Spikes blog. He, he's got a, a great entry on on pinning, so I would definitely recommend doing that. All right. Now now we've talked about encryption that was done locally. Let's talk about encryption. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, encryption over the network. Let's talk about encryption or encryption. Uh, that's uh, that, that's done uh, that's done locally. So I've seen this take uh, one of three common forms. Number one, uh, hard-coded keys. All right. Uh, you know, weak encryption algorithm. You know, people people still use you know weak ciphers and all that stuff. Or maybe some stronger encryption algorithm, but those where their strengths are completely defeated by the fact that they're used improperly. And, uh, and, and, and security decisions are, are made locally and can be, and can be uh, completely bypassed. So one example that I have is an app that has, a, uh, has an authentication token that it presents to the server. And the token is a SHA-1 hash that's based on a phone number. Let's think about this. SHA-1 hash based on the phone number. SHA-1 hash, all right, reasonably secure. That's fine. But it's something that we control locally. So once we know that the phone number is what's used to generate the SHA-1 hash, the question is, well, can we maybe SHA-1 hash other phone numbers and all of a sudden become different users of the application? So, uh, so, so, so this is actually exact, exactly what happened. I mean, this was a pretty, pretty massive fail. So. I do that on request, sure. Here you go. <laughs> this guy may not know a lot about encryption, though. All right. All right. So, um, to kind of recap the whole encryption thing here, uh, a few suggestions. So, don't abuse SSL. Uh, if there's a trust manager, use it as intended. Don't try to, you know, don't try to get around it, even 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 in the in the development code. Uh, augment augment your stuff by uh, pinning certificates. You can use other stuff. You can use, you know, mutual authentication is also a good idea to use so that you are now presenting client cert to the server, so that the server would know who's connecting to it. Also, check the local s signature of an application to make sure that your application hasn't been messed with. Maybe a, a, little, a little extra bit of work, but still worth it. And, and you know, in terms of protecting your, protecting your application from maybe remote man in the middling, um, it would be, you know, you can't really force traffic out of, out of a specific interface on, uh, on Android, as far as I know, but you can certainly prefer one interface over, an, over another. And so um, what I would do is, in my code, I would, I would assume that everything goes over um, Wi-Fi that can be controlled by an attacker and prefer, and, 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 and prefer to send traffic um, out of the cell network. All right, so here is some, uh, some, tech, some technical suggestions. You know, remove debugging code, secure your app's resources, um, meaning make sure that your you know, file permissions, file permissions are set properly, you can use certificate pinning. Definitely use obfuscators. Make sure that you use ProGuard. It's free. Um, uh, Android lets you, lets you use that for, for everything that you write. It also strips unused code, which, which is a good idea anyway. But, but most of the time, you know, try, to, try, try to really look at the big picture um, and, and recommend to others to look at the big picture. So try to, try to you know, think, think like a hacker. And what it means is, you know, look at your application from a very high level perspective. <laughs> Try to enumerate the risks. Maybe there are certain things that you did not intend to happen, and they would happen anyway, right? So, um, so there could be you know, risks to your data, there could be risks to the, uh, to the infrastructure. And so uh, these are some of the things that you need to keep in mind as you're, as, as you're um, pulling together your app. Uh, next step, identify uh, the attack surface. Uh, and, so, and so I think what that, what that cat was doing there was trying to identify the attack surface with, with a turtle. 
Uh, so think about you know what sensitive info is transmitted by your app. You know what's stored. Are you maybe using some some insecure libraries? Um, and, and, and so all of these things together, they really help. Um, they really help uh, create a more secure application from the get-go. You know, as opposed to, as opposed to um, as opposed to you know trying to patch it later. And uh, you know, finally, challenge your assumptions about 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 security. I gave you an NFC example, right? Where an assumption was made or possibly made that something that came from from uh, an NFC interface is somehow more secure may not necessarily be the case because you know you may think that attacker may not have access to the hardware required to write to a tag or you know do some or deal with some other technology but the truth of the matter is it it's actually much more possible that you may think it is so just keep that in mind and challenge your own assumptions yeah, all right and uh, and you know finally um, it's it's important to understand you know how Android reversing works so I mean, you know, there is a lot of conversations about you know how secure or insecure Android platform is. The truth, the truth is that the oversight on what apps get pushed into the market may not be you know as as rigorous as with some other platforms. And I'm going to let you guess which platforms I'm talking about. Um, so you can pull apps from a phone, you can recompile them. You, uh, you can patch them, you can recompile them pretty easily. There's a ton of tools available. You can change the code uh, because the apps are written in Java. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that you can do with, uh, with, uh, with an app. So the most important thing is you, know, you really should know how the app could be broken. And with this, I'm going to uh, move to the um, IG Learner app demo. That, uh, <clears throat> so this is going to be a demo of the IG Learner app, and it's uh, like a city app style app, CTF is the, uh, for those who don't know, capture the flag, type application. Uh, it's it's a, a bit easier than a regular CTF, but it's like a, 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 a lesson based, like a, like a level based uh, type of thing where uh, you have a whole bunch of challenges and you're supposed to, um, and you're supposed to solve those challenges. The uh, QR code here links to the market. I'm telling you it's totally legit to go ahead and download that. Take my word for it. <laughs> I, I, I really like watching people's reactions to take my word for it. Okay, and, uh, and we also have the code up on GitHub for this. Uh, there is a walkthrough. Uh, it's currently being finalized, uh, so please check back on intrepidusgroup.com's inside blog. Um, and also, you know, I definitely wanted to mention two more things. You know, shouts out to uh, you know, Jack Manino, uh, who kind of inspired, who, whose GoDroid project kind of inspired me to write this. Um, definitely check out that project. It's 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 awesome. Highly recommend it. And the entire mo mobile OWASP top ten. Um, there are quite a few differences between you know this and GoDroid, and you'll see them. But I would I would say to definitely check out check out Jack Manino's uh, OWASP Top Ten project and the GoDroid application. Um, all right, and and by the way, you don't really need anything besides the APK uh, to to run this. So uh, all right, demo. All right, so I'm going to move this over. So what happens here is uh, what happens here is um, this is the listing of lessons. Uh, so we have lesson for 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 every every topic there. You can see the instructions if you want to read the inst instructions. And then um, you can uh, all right close the instructions. In hindsight, I probably should have made the video a go a little bit faster. Apologies. Um, so you, you, can, you can try to type in some, some uh, garbage in there. And so by the way, like right now, I'm burning, I'm burning one of the lessons. This is like the most trivial lesson of the application. Uh, it's, it's really, really simple, really easy, but I just wanted to kind of make sure that you see the, you get the flavor of, of what this is. So this dumped a whole bunch of debugging output to the logcat console. And there is a secret code that's lurking in there somewhere. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to show you how this how this works. All right, so that's the code right there. All right, 
So the next step is going to be, I'm going to punch this code into my app. Spoiler, I'm going to I'm going to punch in the correct code here. All right. And so, you know, like I said, um, an important an important thing that I want to mention here is that this is a really trivial lesson and uh, the other lessons are quite a bit harder, but I think they're, they kind of go increasingly harder as you progress through the exercise. Um, and so this is just a, a quick overview of some of the tools that you may want to use as you're taking apart the application if you want to. So Dex2Jar will give you, uh, will, will uh, translate the APK, the installation file, to uh, a readable Java code. The problem with Java code, you, even though you can read it and, and understand the uh, logic of the application a lot easier than otherwise, um, you can't really recompile it back into an application. If, again, this is something that you would normally use to just try to understand the logic of the app and then just putting this into a Java decompiler and running this um, inside the JD GUI tool. So here this is, let's see, like this, this is my uh, logging, logging garbage method. You can see that the code is not obfuscated. It was actually not obfuscated on purpose. Uh, and this is a um, and this is the Virtual Ten Studio tool that I used to look at the Smalley code. And Smalley code is um, is a is a is effectively the instructions that run in the Dalek VM. And the Smalley representation of an APK is something that you would use to actually patch the code, make changes to it, and uh, recompile it back. So I'm going to actually going to kill the video a little earlier here, a little early here because. Um, you know, just to save some time, but I'm going to tell you that uh, with this tool, which is, by the way, a great tool, Virtual Ten Studio is its name. Uh, what you can do is you can just uh, recompile it and push it back at the click of a button, which is pretty, pretty simple. And you can just take my word for it again that it's actually going to push back and execute just fine. So um, I know that I'm running a little bit short on time, so I'm just going to close this up right here and. say that here we're done. Uh, if you still want to get the app, download the app, uh, the QR code is right there. So thanks very much for, for coming out. Thanks very much for uh, listening to me. And uh, if you have any questions, I think, uh, do you have time for questions? I would gladly take some. So, um, so, so, the, so, so, so the question was whether there were any um, any any uh, methods for reversing ProGuard obfuscation, and if um, and if apps were using ProGuard. So, you know, part of the problem with obfuscation is that sometimes you may not know what the problem was obfuscated with. Uh, ProGuard, I would say. I mean, I would I would say like knowing. Uh, the transition between the source code and the um, like known by the source code, a lot of a lot of people do use ProGuard, but uh, but 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 yeah, that's uh, that's uh, um, that's sometimes a little bit difficult to uh, figure out what it was what it was uh, obfuscated with. And then in terms of anti-obfuscation, you can have some indirect methods of trying to figure out um, how things were obfuscated. Uh, but these are really, um, like I said, the, the key word here is indirect method, right? You can deduce by, let's say, following the class class hierarchy to say, hey, like this seems to inherit from this class and this seems to inherit from this class. This is what's probably this is what's probably happening. Uh, but there is no no tool that I'm aware of that would just take an you know take an, uh, an obfuscated APK and turn that into a non obfuscated code. If that answers the question. Anything else? Anyone else?
Thanks, guys. Oh, actually.